to this church. Y'all look good. Santa Claus must have been real good to some of y'all. My mama used to call it Jesus Claus because she wasn't about to give glory to Santa Claus. But she would let me play along a little bit. How was Christmas for everybody? Everybody had a good Christmas? My laptop won't open. Let me concentrate. There we go. It's open now. Y'all ready for a word from the Lord? So this time last year, I, I just want to say, you guys, that God called me when I was 15 years old to preach the gospel. And every time I stand at this desk in this pulpit, it is a privilege and an honor for me to stand here. I get excited like a kid in a candy store because, God, wow. Little 15-year-old kid in the middle of Belafonte Avenue at Huntsville, Alabama, sitting in his room crying his eyes out, hoping that God would pour out his spirit on him so that he could preach. And now I stand here today at 28 years old, 14 years later, preaching God's word. So I'm so grateful to stand here today. One year ago, God gave me this word called No Missed Opportunities. Anybody was here last year and got to hear that? And it blessed my life, but I'm still learning from those principles that I taught you guys last year. I'm still learning myself. I'm still a student of the word. Uh, uh, one thing that I'm still learning and developing from is I'm still fat. And one of my New Year's resolutions was to lose some weight and it looked like I failed at that one. You can laugh. It's okay. Maybe this time next year it'll be different. I gotta keep trying. That's right. Never give up. Keep pouring out. I'm still going to Popeye's. That blessed Baptist bird. Anointed in holy oils. Yes, I'm still going to Popeye's. This time, though, I go in incognito. Like, I'm I kind of like, yeah, let me get a toe purse, smart, you know, kind of hide in my voice. I don't go in public anymore. And I'm still working out different issues. As some of you still working on whatever you're working on, right? A few unexpected things happened this year. Unexpected blessings, unexpected tragedies. And some of you probably have the same testimony. But on this side of 2018, we can say that we're here today. And that we have breath in our body. And everything that has breath, praise ye the Lord. So God, as we enter 2019 in a few days, Lord, that we pray that we would receive a new measure of faith. That you would pour out your spirit upon all people in this place and even further. God, you are in this place. God, would you awaken dry bones today, God? Would you pour out your spirit, a new fire into your people today, God? A new measure of faith, a new measure of love, a new measure of hope for all this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These seven verses have changed my life. Back in February, my wife revealed them to me. She was reading her version app, and it was the verse of the day, the chapters of the day. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. She, as immediately as she read it, she came to me. She was like, baby, you got to read this. So I looked at it, and I was like, oh, Lord. I had never read this scripture before, this story. I never heard it before. And now I want to share it with you guys because I hope that it, cha it changed the trajectory of my faith. And I'm hoping it changes yours. So let's read together. It says, verse 1, the widow of one of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah, saying, My servant, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. The creditor, Sally Mae, is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Look at your neighbor and say, What do you have? This word for me is for this. God, thank you. Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Everybody say nothing but. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it all 
depth into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her two sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Everybody say pour it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Verse 7, then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. The title of this message is No Missed Opportunities, Part 2, the sequel. I love movies, Star Wars. Some of y'all have seen this movie on Netflix called Bird Box. And no, I'm not preaching a message about Bird Box today. But I guarantee you it's a preacher here in America somewhere preaching about Bird Box today, and God bless him. But I'll be honest with you. I thought Bird Box was a box of Popeye's chicken, and that's no joke. That's the, be- that's the only Bird Box I care about, Chick-fil-A nuggets, chicken. I'm just acting all up up here, embarrassing my wife. Verse 1, um, the point for verse 1 is don't suffer alone cry out for help. We see this woman, verse 1, we see her, yeah, don't suffer alone. Don't suffer alone. In 2019, in 2018, you might have chosen to suffer alone. You might have chosen to isolate yourself. You know what? In 2019, we're not going to miss the opportunity to cry out for help. It says, the widow of one of the sons of the prophet cried out to Elijah saying, your servant, my husband, is dead. And then it says, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. You know he was with God. The creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slave. Now, you might be sitting here and looking at the scripture and wondering, is this dead husband the son of Elijah? Because it says the sons of the prophet. And I, um, I thought that at first when I read it too, but then I dug a little bit, and it really means like the school of prophets or the staff. So here at Mosaic, we have a staff, and Pastor Mark and Pastor Harry are our leadership, and I'm like a student of their leadership. And so this would be almost as if, God forbid, if I passed away or Pastor Alex passed away and their wife, the wife, my wife, would be left behind with debt and two sons. Now, we don't have two sons and we working on the debt, but it would be like that. So this is a situation where the leader of the body is coming to look after his flock. And thank God we have a a leader in Pastor Harry and and Pastor Mark that would look after each and every one of us when we're in our bereavement or even in our benevolence issues. But it's not just left up to them. Each and every one of us have a responsibility as believers to look into the congregational needs of our body, not just in death or in life, but even in little small issues. And so this man of God is looking into his flock and he is checking into her. And this widow's issue is no unusual thing. This widow's issue is no unusual thing. The culture of the day allowed creditors, debt collectors, to take children as slaves to satisfy a debt. And some of y'all is like, sign me up now. If it means that Sally may stop calling my phone and sending me death threats, come on. Free child care? Wow. This is a big deal, though. Uh, This issue was often abused back then to satisfy some selfish gain by the leaders of the day. So, you know, some of you have no reservations about it. You know what? Go ahead, little junior, and go on and do that work, and then come on back when the money's paid off. But in this situation, this is a big problem. Women back then in this day did not have equality with men. So they could not conduct business. They couldn't purchase items. And they didn't have protection back then as if they were right now. Some of y'all independent single mothers in here have no problem. But back then, this would be a major issue. This woman had great need. Anybody in the room has ever had great need? Everybody in this room ought to be shouting because all of us have had some great need that we need fulfillment. And you know what? This woman cried out to the man of God and told him her issue, and he heard her issue, and God sent a strategy for her issue. 
And do you know that we can do the same thing because we have access, unlimited access to God because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. So we don't even have to go to Pastor Mark, Pastor Harry, or whomever. We can go to God directly ourselves. We don't have to go to a priest and confess and do 10 Hail Marys. We can go exactly to God and tell him, cry out unto the Lord. Do you know that in the word of God it says that we can cry out to the Lord. I heard the cry unto the Lord in verse uh, Psalms 18 and 6. It says, in my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried out for help. His, from his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. God hears your cries. In Matthew 7 and 7, it says, ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. In the old church, we used to sing, pass me not, oh gentle Savior, help me sing, hear my humble cry. Y'all can sing. While on others thou art calling, do not. Come on, let's take it home. I'm saying can sing good. We got some hymn singing people in this room. But do you know that hymn is so true? It says, hear my humble cry. That's scripture, just song. God hears our humble cry. He hears our cries at night. He hears it. But he doesn't just hear it. He, God is like a therapist where he listens but he's also writing notes as he's listening, getting ready to write you a prescription that will completely heal and fix your problem that you are crying about. You don't even have to come back every Wednesday or once a week or once a month. You should. You should come back every time you're going through and when you're not going through. But he completely can transform the issue. No need for a refill of the prescription. Anybody need a guy like that? Anybody need a, a therapist like that, a healer, a, a doctor like that? God is that. You can cry out to God. You can cast your cares to God. Some of us macho men in here, I'm telling you this morning, early 9 o'clock, I was crying. Because I just was so supremely grateful to the Lord for hearing my cry. You don't have to cry alone either. Some of us need to get in community. Get around some people that really care about us and love us, the folks, not the folks that talk about us behind our back, but really, really get around some real love people, some really loving people. And we need to cry out, cry out for help, cry out for strategy. Some of you need to cry out right now. That's all you needed to hear today is that you can literally cry out. God will hear your cry. Not only will he hear you, but we get more than just a listening ear. We get strategy. So that's verse 2. Verse 2, Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. The second point is, don't miss the opportunity. Don't discount your gift. Use it. Don't discount your gift. Use it. So Eliza listens to her distress in the situation, and he asks her two questions, just two. The two questions aren't accusatory questions to investigate if she was irresponsible with her income. They were just two questions. And y'all know y'all got some family members and some friends. If you ask them for some help, they'll be like, well, where was you at? And what was you doing with the money? And when are you going to pay me back? You know, we all, some of us got some friends like that, and we need to cut them off in 2019 and get them out of our life because there's no more room for toxic friendships, toxic relationships in 2019. Cut them off. And I'm not saying cut them off from the Lord. Keep praying for them. Keep loving them. But you don't, mm -mm. we don't need friends like that. We need real, really real relationships and friendships, family ships. 
that we can cry out for help from our friends and they don't ask those type of questions. They ask these questions. Elijah asked two questions that required her to have vision and inventory. The first question is, what shall I do for you? Not where, where did you spend your money, not any of that. What shall I do for you? And some of you, God is asking you that. What can I do for you? What shall I do for you to fix the problem that you're crying out in distress about late in the midnight hour? You know that thing that makes your heart beat real fast? You know the thing that makes you really excited? Sometimes anxious, the thing that you lay awake at night and think about? You know that business plan that you came up with back in 95? And then a few life-changing situations happen and you put that on hold. And then some more stuff happened. You had a few kids and you love your kids so much. And you put the business plan back on hold. And now it's 2005. And it's in the closet somewhere. The whole plan is in the closet. It's, it's, in, it's on floppy disks. And the whole plan is... It's sitting there, and you done packed up stuff on top of your kids, old clothes that you need to give to the thrift store, and you just forgot about it. And God is asking you, what can I do for you? And some of us in the room don't even know the answer because we have forgotten how to dream. Because we have allowed the enemy to get in our life so bad. We have allowed the enemy to, to trick us and put us in the sunken place, this place of faithless fear and doubt, this dark place where we can't see our way out. Satan wants us to be there so bad so that we can forget about the dreams that God poured out onto us in the first place. So when somebody asks you, well, what can I do to help you? Or when God literally asks you, what can I do to help you? We don't have an answer. Or we have some open-ended answer. Like, if somebody walked up to you and said, I want to clear your debt up, we would have, how much, they would ask us, how much do you need to clear your debt? And we would give some open question, answer, like, uh, like 75000 just to hear or there. And God is looking for a specific answer, $75,235.65 to the T. We have to be specific in what we request from the Lord because he is specifically going to bless us once we have the answer. What can I do for you? And it's not just finances. It's not just a business plan. Some of us need emotional healing. Some of us have been through some emotional things in our life and we just want to be free from it. What can I do for you? God is not just asking what can he do for you. but He's asking you. What do you have? So a lot of times when we're in great need, we're so blinded by that need that we don't even think reasonably or logically about what we have. We're blinded by our gifts. Look at the scripture. It says, he asked her, what do you have in the house? And she responds, I have nothing. Pause. Now, look, this is the Old Testament. It's written in Hebrew. The king's language. And I don't read Hebrew that well because I ain't studied Hebrew before. There's a lot of folks who have, and God bless them. But when I found out that it reads the other way and not the way that we read, I was like, oh, I'm good. <laughs> but you know what? The Alabama graduation exam said that I can read English on a 12th grade level. And so I can read English pretty well. And when I see I have nothing, what does nothing mean? Ooh, y'all read English too. Arkansas got some good education going on. But literally, she says, I have nothing but this little jar of oil. Wait a minute, lady. If you have nothing, then you have nothing. If you have a jar of oil, forget the nothing but and just say, I have a jar of oil. So this tells me, this reveals to me that the woman is discounting her gift. She has a jar of oil. And that is something we need to hear. Some of us in the room have a lot of gifts in the room, but we discard it. We say, well, when God asks what do we have, we say, oh, I have nothing but this little ability to sing. Uh, I have this little ability to connect with people. Do you know if you can connect with people, you are a networker. Man, if you have the ability to build relationships with people, you are you are above. There's so many people who just don't have the social cues to be able to connect with people on a relational level. 
Some, some of you in this room make little quirky paperclip things and that you really like them, but you just discount it as this little nothing but thing. And right now, somebody is on Etsy and eBay looking for those little quirky little paperclip things. They just as quirky and weird as you, and they don't even know they're looking for the Etsy thing. And, and you sitting at home talking about your little paperclips is, is nothing. All of us have a gift. God has given us that gift. He didn't, he didn't just give us that gift for us to hoard it and discard it as nothing but. God has given us a significant gift. There's significance in this oil. If you look at the scripture all over the books, the Bible, God takes little small things like bread and water and, and wine, and he makes it into something big and significant and spiritual. So like bread, when we take communion, bread is regarded as the body of Christ, right? Wine is regarded as the blood of Jesus. In this case, in the scripture, oil represents the anointing of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit himself. Oil was used to anoint kings and priests and, and prophets. Oil was a nothing, it was not just a little nothing. It was big. It was sacred. It was valuable. And a lot of us have gifts that are sacred, that have been bestowed upon us by God that is valuable. And God is fully armed and is capable of taking on that gift that we discard as nothing but and making something miraculous about it. Making something bigger than life through it. And we have to be open to use it. So the first point is to cry out for help. Don't suffer alone. The second point is don't discard your gift. Discount your gift. Use it. The third point in verse 3, let's read it. He said, then he said... Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from your neighbors, empty vessels. Don't just gather a few. In 2019, we need to break pride, entitlement, and scarcity. Look at your neighbor dead center in the eyes. All the introverts is like, oh, God. <laughs> I'm an extrovert, so I like looking folks in the eyes. Tell them to break pride, break entitlement, break scarcity. After this woman shares with Elijah that she has oil, we see him give specific instructions for her to follow. He begins to strategize a plan for her problem. He tells her to borrow vessels. And that's where a lot of us would give up, right there. You know what? I can cry out and I can shout out my issues and I can even take inventory of what gifts I have, but you are not about to tell me to go and borrow anything from anybody. A lot of us, if we was on the phone with God, we would hang up, click up, dial tone. But God is literally asking some of us in this room in 2019 to break that pride mindset. Do you know pride is, it comes before the fall? Do you know pride is exactly what Lucifer dealt with that caused him to be cast down onto this earth? Pride is dangerous. Pride keeps you hungry. Pride keeps you in the dark. Pride gets your lights cut off, gets you evicted. Pride is not what we need to live by. Pride. But we don't want to bother anybody, though. We don't. A lot of times, we, we don't want to borrow anything. We don't want to borrow ideas. We don't want to borrow tools. Some of us know how to fix cars in the room. Who knows how to fix cars? Raise your hand if you can fix cars. All two of you, all right. <laughs> Holler at me after church because I got a car sitting up right now in Lone Oak, Arkansas that I need help fixing. I don't know how to fix nothing. I don't even know how to change my own oil. I didn't learn that. I know how to preach, and I know how to read my Bible, and that's all I know how to do. Help me, please. You see how that works? Ask for some help. It's easy. If you're watching online, I need you to help me fix my car. <laughs> help me. But we, we have been given, in America, we've been given this ideology to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And don't get me wrong, I love that ideology. 
because it is very helpful. But if you don't have no boots, how can you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? Help me understand. If you don't have boots, how can you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? So you need to go to the shoe store and say, hey, can I borrow some boots? We won't go borrow vessels because of pride. While you're grinding and working yourself down to the bone for an original idea, there's somebody out there right now borrowing an idea and they're winning. If you're like me and you spend about five hours a week on social media, that's what Apple told me with the new update. They keep up with what I do, the Illuminati. <laughs> but, um, um, <laughs> what you have seen on social media for the last three weeks is two things. Bird box, can't, can't get rid of it. And you've seen, if for, for some of us younger people, like people who keep up with music, you've seen this stuff about Jockeys. Now, if you don't know who Jockeys is, he is an R&B singer. Well, he called himself a singer. He tried to sing, but my man can't sing. I ain't, hey, Jockeys, if you're watching, I'm sorry. Don't come at me. Don't at me. Just, I'm just being real. The man can't sing. But you know what he does? This is what he does. He takes popular R&B songs, remixes them, and messes them up, and then puts them on social media, and everybody watches it, and he gets a bunch of views. And he made this claim about three weeks ago. He says, I'm the king of R&B. Well, how prideful are you? And everybody was like, no, you're not. You're not even the jester of R&B. You're not even the janitor of R&B. But you know what? God humbled me. He told me to look up Jockeys' net worth. <laughs> While I'm talking about he can't sing, this man has a $6 million net worth. Wow, and we can't even borrow $600 from, from Bank of America right now. If we went up there, they'd tell you, go on home. <laughs> this man took other people's stuff Remixed it, mixed it, and messed it up and made six million dollars while we're sitting at home trying to come up with some original plan and can't make it two nickels rubbed together with it. Go out and borrow. Elijah instructed her to borrow vessels from all her neighbors, not just a few. And this is telling me and you to break the mindset of scarcity. One of our principles here at Mosaic is to live in abundance, not scarcity. God did not create us to live in a scarce place. God created us to live abundant and even more abundant. Scarcity is a dangerous mindset if it's not channeled the right way. The mindset of scarcity will keep you broke and hungry. I said that earlier. But some people use scarcity to get through tough times, all right? So that's what I call survival. You know, instead of going to get spaghetti noodles, you're getting ramen noodles. You know how that works? Maybe some of you don't work like that. But okay, bless you and bless your ministry. But God has not called us to scarcity. He, he has called us to abundance and more abundance. Sometimes abundance looks like having peace in the midst of your grief. It doesn't look like a big car and a big house and a big job or whatever. Sometimes it does look like that. But sometimes it looks like diligently serving the Lord in the midst of a heartbreak. Sometimes abundance looks like all of your bills are paid and your expenses are paid, but you don't have movies, money to go to the movies to see Aquaman. And you're sitting your tail at home and you're cooking a home-cooked meal. You don't get the order out. And you turn on Netflix and you watch Bird Box. Sometimes that's what abundance looks like. God is molding us into a new creation that embraces the abundant life. And sometimes that means borrowing. It means asking for assistance. It means teaming up with somebody that has wisdom. Do you know some of us has grown up in poverty and we don't understand what it means to have money. So when we get money, we blow all the money. Anybody been through that before? Sometimes it means getting with some older, wiser person that's been through the ropes before, sitting with them and asking them, hey, man, can you help me do a budget? Can you help me with my accounting for my business? But we sit up and we're so prideful we don't ask for help. 
And God is asking us to go borrow a vessel. The widow cried out for help. Elijah revealed the value of her oil, and she did not reserve when he asked her to borrow vessels. She sent her sons out to go borrow the vessels. That reminds me, when I was a kid, that um, my stepdad, in all his country boy splendor, would wake us up on Saturday morning at the crack of dawn before Moses and Elijah got up. And he would take us to the middle, me and him, we would go to the middle of nowhere on rest on Arsenal, and we would till the ground and weed the ground. He wanted to be a farmer. He works for the Army, but he missed his calling. I think he needs to be a farmer. I think that's what his retirement's going to be. We'll holler at you when we got some fruit and stuff. But I, I did not like that when I was a kid. But now it's coming to be profitable right now because... God was showing me the other day when I was looking at this text, why, why would this woman be asked to go and close the door behind her? That's what it says in the verse. And God showed me that when you put a seed into the ground, it is enclosed into the earth, away from birds and prey and things that would take the seed up or pull the seed up, away from nature, just isolated by itself so that it can grow a plant. And just like this woman, she's like the seed. God wants her to close the door behind her. And that's the third point. Shut the door and pour. A lot of us have this codependent spirit about us where we need to be around people to serve God. We need to be in worship around a big group of people so that we can lift our hands. We need to see people worshiping for us to worship. We need to be around other people so that we can read our Bibles. And God is saying... I love that. I love that you're in community. I love that you love being around people. But I really just want to spend some time alone with you. I want you to get in the ground. I want you to be away from distractions and things that could derail you from serving me, derail you from looking to me. You know, we got some people in our lives that mean well, but then they speak into our lives and they don't really know what they're talking about. And so they distract us from what God's real purpose for us is. And God is saying, man, I want you to get alone so you can hear from me so that you can pour this oil into these vessels. God wants us to get alone, to get intimate. When me and Dominique first started dating, and if they tell you what I said in first service, don't believe them because I didn't say that. But when me and Dominique first started dating, um, I like spending time with her, but I wanted to spend time with, like, a big group of friends. So, like, instead of going on, like, real dates, like, with just she and I, like, it would be, like, ten of us huddled up in my grandmama's basement, hanging out, playing video games, watching TV and stuff. And I would call that a date. I ain't have no game back then, so. But, one day she pulled me aside. This is about a year, two years into our relationship. We're like 19, 20. We're in college and stuff. And she pulls me to the side and she's like, I, I, I don't think you like me. And I was like, well, I love you. What do you mean? She's like, well, why do you want to spend time with me? We don't spend any time together. And I was like, well, what do you mean? We spend time together all the time. She was like, no, we don't. We always around your snot-nosed cousins and I like them, but they get on my nerves sometimes. And God is saying to you, spend some time with me. He doesn't need you, but he wants you. Does that make sense? God wants us to spend time with him. Shut the door and pour. The last two verses are where the blessing comes forth. It starts with, now it came to pass. And for some of you, in 2019, that will be your came to pass. Whatever you are dealing with on this side of 2018, I pray to God that in 2019 that you can testify and stand before God and say, it came to pass. That that business plan that I put off since 1989, it came to pass. That thing that I always wanted to do to glorify God came to pass. It came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. 
And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. The last point I want to make is move forward and thrive. First point is to cry out for help when we need it. Don't suffer alone. Second point, don't discount our gifts. Third point, break pride, entitlement, and scarcity. This point, go forward and thrive. The woman poured and poured and poured so much that the vessels were full. She believed God so big that she asked her son to bring her another vessel. And y'all see in the scripture, there were no more vessels. God had increased so big that every pot in the house was full. This woman was sitting on a breakthrough. God had worked on her behalf in such a way that her house was full of a blessing. And some of you have a gift that is so precious that it can literally change the trajectory of your family and your community, and you're calling it a nothing but gift. You are belittling the gift that God has bestowed upon you. The big idea here is for us to discontinue the poisonous ideology that we have some little gift. Get rid of that. Leave that here in 2018. Don't go to 2019 with that mindset. That, that little jar of oil just canceled this woman's debt. Sally Mae is no longer calling her way. And some of y'all need that blessing right now in this room. I'm tired of them calling me. I ain't... Mm. One day, one day, I used to regard, I, I had a little jar of oil just like this lady. I had this, around eight years old, God revealed to me, and I didn't even know that I, I have musical gifting. Like I sang this little light of mine in the church choir, and all the old ladies started shouting in the church, and that was cool to me. And I didn't really think of anything about it. And then I went off to school and majored in music and didn't like being a music major because it's like having three jobs and a baby. It's just too much. <laughs> JB, you know about that. He finished. I don't, man, you are anointed man of God because music major, you have to go to school, make good grades, be in the band, do one-on-ones uh, -on with your music coach and then perform and you can't have a job you just it's too much for me it was too much but I would sit in my dorm room and scribble these little poems into my journal and write these little songs in my journal then I left school and I went back home and I lived with my grandma and started working in the workforce and I would write these little songs some more and just it was cathartic to me it was like therapy because I had been through so much in college and I started college with a full scholarship and ended with nothing by 21. Lost my apartment, my car, everything. So I was sitting at my grandma. I was at my grandma's house. You can't have no game at your grandma's house. Y'all see what I'm going through? Like, do you feel me? But I would write these songs, and I wrote this little song called Not Consume, and I just left it in my journal. Then I started this job at Direct TV. I'm telling y'all a story, not because I want y'all to know my business, but it's, a, it's an end to it. Started this job at this God-forsaken place called Direct TV. And I would work 3 p.m. to 12 a.m. every night, getting cussed out about whatever channel the person didn't have or didn't, did have. Getting cussed out about the bill. My first day on the job, on the sales floor, I had a manager. His name's Alexander Wade. Alexander Wade is actually a pastor, too, in Huntsville, Alabama. It's so funny how God called us both to ministry. But he was my manager, but he took, like, a lot of interest in me. And I was like, hold up, bro. I don't know. Before, you know. So we were at lunch the first day on the job. And he, um, he was listening to some music on his phone. And he, he asked me, hey, man, you like Christian rap? I was like, Whoa. I never met anyone outside of church that listened to Christian rap. 
I'm like, I love Christian rap. Matter of fact, I write some. He was like, really? He was like, let's go to my car. I was like, hold on, bro. I don't know you like that. <laughs> Went to his car. He played these beats that he had made. They were really awesome. Like, and he was like, go and rap for me, man. So I pulled my phone out, and I was so nervous. I rapped for him. He was like, dude, can you come to my house after work? I was like, hold on, bro. I don't know you like that. Plus, I told you we worked 3 p.m. to 12. So that means I was over his house after midnight. And my grandmama told me, don't nothing happen after midnight but what you know about. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm sorry. I watch a lot of Kevin Hart and stuff. I'm just, I like comedy. But I went to his house and he, he was like, hey, man, I want you to, like, pick a beat and let's just make some music. And we did that every day for months and months in 2014. And that was me and Dominique's first year anniversary. And I was out after midnight every night. And she was like, where are you? I'm in some dude's studio. She was like, get out of there. We rocked so hard that year, we made a little album. A little, little album. Five tracks. We put it out January 2015. And as soon as we put it out, God revealed to me and Dominique that we needed to move here to Little Rock. And I was doing shows, like two or three shows every month all over North Alabama. And we moved here, and I had to start over musically. So what I did was I sent a bunch of emails to every church that I could look up on Google. You remember that day? Dominique thought I was going crazy. I sent emails for weeks to every church I could, not so that I could join staff or be on staff or anything. I just wanted to share the music so it could get with the right people, so that it could bless someone's life like music has blessed my life. So I sent this email to Mosaic Church of Central Arkansas, And a month later, I was sitting at Guillermo's coffee shop with Pastor Harry and Pastor Chuck. And they, Pastor Harry with his big smile. We just think you're God's man for this role as youth pastor. And I was like, are y'all crazy? I'm just some little old kid from Alabama. I don't have a college degree. I've not served in vocational ministry before. I've served as, served as a lay, lay minister. Like, I don't, I don't know about this, man. And I told him no. I didn't even apply for the job, and I told him no. Pastor Harry, you remember I told you no. Then I went back to, to work at Verizon. I was working there. Another God place in place, forsaken place. And I got cussed out. As soon as I got on the phone, beep, blankety blank blank, over the iPhone 6S. It's not, I mean, it's an iPhone, y'all. Make me hate iPhones. Every year when a new iPhone come out, I get anxiety because it's like, ugh. And then I called Pastor Chuck, and I just was like, man, I'm going through, bro. Can you pray for me? And he prayed for me, and I felt better. And then he was like, bro, I, honestly, we still waiting for you to accept this job. It had been months. Like, the whole summer had went by. And I went home, and I asked Dominique about it, and she was like, well, let's pray about it for a week. So we prayed, and God allowed us to come here and be on staff because I wrote little songs, and I sent some little emails, and I got a little interview with the little church called Mosaic Church. Now, that's not even the big part. A year later, after youth ministry night on Wednesday night, we had it back then at Wednesday, after church, this kid walks up to me, and he's in college now. He walked up to me. He was like, man, can I tell you something? And I was like, sure, what is it? He was like, I listened to your song, Not Consume, and it really helped me, like, heal from some emotional distress that I was facing. And I'm talking about, like, the deep type of emotional stress, self-harm type stuff. And that's what the song is about. It's like releasing that to the Lord. We're not consumed. And that's when it all clicked, that my little gift became something bigger than me. It 
bless some other kid's life. And I'm telling you that testimony, not for you to know anything about me. I'm not trying to shine any light on myself. I'm trying to tell you that in 2019, your little gift can literally change the trajectory of someone else's life. And as long as you hoard your gift and just count it as a nothing but little jar of oil, it will just be a little nothing but with your nothing but. But if you open up that little can of oil and pour that oil into those vessels, lives can be changed. So God, we pray right now that in 2019 that we do not miss the opportunity to use our gift so that we can be a blessing to someone else, so that we can cancel some generational bondage that is on our life. God, you have bestowed those gifts upon us for a reason, and that reason alone is to glorify you, to give you glory. So this tide of 2019, as we reach into 2019, God, would you just show us how we can use that gift to bless others? to bless this community, to bless this world. This is what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys be blessed. Whoa. I remember that conversation. And um, I remember those first conversations with Kai. The first time he showed up across the street, sitting there. He came early for some reason. He was just sitting there by himself. And... Just within one conversation, we knew there was something special going on. You know what we always say around here, right? God doesn't call, call the call. Sorry. God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the call. That's so much the story of our staff here. We're so blessed. And so thank you, Kai, for being obedient. And don't tell him how great his sermon was, okay? But tell him how great God used him this morning. It's an awesome, awesome testimony.